Jeremy came to Corvallis in about 2008. He has gotten, he got his bachelor's and master's at Colorado State in fish biology as a bachelor's and river ecology as a master's. And he's going to run through some of his video and his imagery that demonstrates, takes us into that habitat, shows us land prey, where they live. Following Jeremy will be Carl Schreck. Carl is the leader of the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at Oregon State. In 2007, he received the Meritorious Presidential Rank Award for his leadership and contributions to fisher sciences. He is actually an employee of the U.S. Geological Survey. But I'm delighted to bring these two experts and, and communicators about fisheries up here to this stage. This is the hot spot of land prey, maybe in the world right now, I don't know. But I'm delighted to bring Jeremy and Carl up here. So please give them a warm side of welcome. Well, thanks, everybody. So um, can you hear me OK? Uh, yeah, you're in for a treat, as Nick mentioned. You get to hear from the, uh, one of our great lamprey biologists. You get to hear from a great biologist about one of the granddaddies of all fish, which you'll find out a lot more about. Um, I've been pretty lucky for the past few years to be able to work on uh, a film series on Pacific lamprey. So a lot of the imagery and some of the things I'll be showing you tonight are little clips of those films and um, uh, uh, material that I've been collecting uh, related to that. Um, before I do that, I just want to um, just acknowledge some of the partners that we've worked, worked with. We've had lots of people helping us do this work. Um, lots of cooperators, both at Oregon State University um, and, and other agencies. And I definitely want to acknowledge the team that helps us do this work. Um, and especially Dave Harris-Simchuk, who this photo, the one uh, that somebody just won, is actually Dave's along with a lot of the great imagery you'll see tonight. So a lot of this work is really a team effort. Um, and then the, the next thing that I'm going to do is, uh, before I tell you anything, I want us to all hear from some of the people who are more connected than any of us um, to Pacific Lamprey. And so I'm going to show a short video that'll, that'll help you hear some of the voices uh, of some of the people who have the, the deepest value and the deepest connection to these fish. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, of just the value that this fish holds um, for the people that have been here longer than any of us and, um, and the potential loss. Um, and, and of course you saw their um, allusions to these pretty drastic declines, which you'll, you'll hear a little bit, uh, a lot about more tonight. <clears throat> so, a fish. Um, in, in a lot of ways, lamprey challenge um, kind of demand that we have open minds. Um, who, who associated tonight lamprey with a fish? And most of us, who, who didn't associate lamprey with a fish? Which is uh, understandable. They're um, they're amazingly ancient fish. Um, they are a fish. Uh, they are commonly called eels, um, just by their common name. Um, but they're technically not an eel, and there there aren't eels on the west coast of North America, like there are on the east coast. So they're kind of commonly called eels in the same way that pandas are called bears. Um, but they're they're amazing fish, and they're uh, in in some ways the uh, uh, Depending on your worldview, you could think of these as our uh, great, 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 greatest grandparents. Um, the fishes are the most divert, diverse vertebrate on the, in the world. There's about 30,000 species of fish. And these ones are, have been around the lampreys as a group as long as any of them. And so in a great big group of family, in a great big group of fish, uh, the, these are some of our oldest. And in some ways, um, all of us are sort of connected to lamprey. Um, it, it, and again, they're, they're ancestral. These, this was a fish that, that evolved before fish sort of started trying out things like fins, uh, paired fins, and um, lots of other things that they, that they evolved. And uh, it's pretty neat. When you snorkel with lamprey, you gain this appreciation for um, just how elegant they are. And uh, again, without those 
things like paired fins and lots of sort of gear that a lot of our more sort of modern fish have. Um, with just this simple body, they can do um, as much as a lot of salmon do in terms of a migration and moving up a river. Um, and in some cases, they go further than salmon because they, can, they have some tricks that um, uh, salmon and lots of other fish don't have. <clears throat> and uh, you saw at the end of that video those um, lamprey moving around rocks, and that's part of how they build a nest in a stream. And of course, uh, they can use that sucker disc in their mouth to pick up stones and, and dig out a red, which is really good for their, um, for laying eggs. Am I, uh, is that too poppy, my voice? And, no, it's good. Okay, good. So um, in some ways, lampreys are a little bit of a misunderstood fish. So this is the business end of, of a Pacific lamprey. Um, and, and they are parasitic out in the ocean uh, when they're in that part of their life cycle. As you saw just there, they also use this mouth to get around and to climb. But from a human perspective, that's one of the sort of strikes against them is that they're, they're parasitic, which I think is uh, not the most endearing uh, trait uh, from our perspective to have. And they're often confused a lot of times with lamprey in the Great Lakes. Who've heard of uh, sort of the bad lamprey that were in the Great Lakes? Which were actually uh, a different species of lamprey that Carl will, will be telling you a little bit more about. But our, our lamprey, these Pacific lamprey and, and the others, they're, they're native here. Um, and we don't have any invasive lamprey here, uh, at least to my knowledge. But they are, they are pretty remarkable. And again, um, this, is, this is a design um, before fish decided to sort of have you know, a movable jaw. But what this does, not only is this um, how they feed when they're out in the ocean, they, can, they use this mouth and suck on and also sort of get a bite to eat from whoever they're riding along with, which might be a, a salmon or a tuna or a whale maybe. Um, but these are also sort of, this is like a boot. You're looking at something that they, they climb around with. And uh, again, when you're snorkeling with them in the stream, you get really jealous because they have this way to just anchor themselves and they can completely relax in the swiftest of currents. <clears throat> In some ways, lampreys are a very invisible fish. Um, th th so uh, like you saw in the trivia, and like, we've, like I've alluded to, they migrate. They do these big migrations from streams like the headwaters of the Marys all the way out to Willamette and Columbia. And they may go to the other side of the Pacific Ocean and then come back. Um, but y who's ever seen a lamprey in the wild? Okay, I'm guessing there's maybe a dozen, between a dozen and two dozen. Most of us haven't seen an adult lamprey. Um, part of that is because they're not as abundant as they once were. Um, but part of that is they're pretty cryptic. Um, they know how to stay out of sight. When they're an adult like this, they're a pretty good meal for a lot of uh, organisms. And what they spend most of their lives actually, and I won't be able to show you pictures of this because I can't afford the camera that I would need to get these pictures. But uh, they spend most of their life as a little earthworm-like larvae in a stream. So they're, they're not only underwater, they're underground underwater. So um, that, that's pretty amazing that, uh, it, 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 that they have this life cycle that, that might take them from you know, five feet under a stream bed all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. And so, uh, but, but you're never going to obviously see a lamprey when it's, when it's uh, unless it's migrating or at a falls. And you saw some of those images in the video where they climb falls. That is one of the most likely places to see a lamprey. Um, we don't have the falls that we once had. And so they're, they're not a very well-known fish. And then, uh, and, and of course, like, uh, like I mentioned, they're in decline. And so in 2003, they were actually petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And uh, they weren't listed because there wasn't a whole lot of information known. And so lamprey have become this frontier for science um, and frontier really for conservation to kind of figure out, well, what's really happening to these fish? And here's a couple um, OSU researchers here, some of Carl's students, um, doing some surveys. This is electrofishing. And they're looking for those little larval lamprey that are down in these sediments. Um, this is, uh, you saw these images also in the video. This is the most lamprey we've ever seen in one place, and this is right below Willamette Falls. Um, in the trivia questions, you saw that the Willamette is one of the strongholds uh, for lamprey. So 
Well, Emma Falls is a place where they all have to climb up um, to get to. And of course, it's long been a place where harvesters go. And uh, some of those harvesters are big white sturgeon who love to eat lamprey. Uh, in fact, lamprey, for a lot of sturgeon fishermen, are a, uh, a pretty good bait to use. Sturgeon, sturgeon themselves are a very, very ancient fish, uh, about half as old as the lampreys. Um, but uh, you can see this mouth that they have that's kind of, uh, can sort of unfold and they're really good at getting lamprey out. And if you go to Willamette Falls in June or July, you're likely to see a sturgeon and you might even be likely to see a sturgeon eat a lamprey right in front of your eyes. It's, the tough part is getting to Willamette Falls, um, which is, uh, you can't get very near these days. Um, and this is some of that uh, harvesting that happens. Uh, and this is usually every uh, June and July. <coughs> and again, uh, lots of, uh, this is another one of Carl's students here. And that's a lamprey on its red. Lots of study going into lamprey now. So uh, if you can imagine, um, they, they, be, they present sort of a paradox for conservation. Um, a lot of the ladders that we built for salmon um, just don't work for lamprey. Uh, Carl will be telling you more about that. So that was a big fix when we put in these dams were fish ladders and also hatcheries. Well, those are two things that to date haven't really worked very well for lamprey. One, we haven't really tried to put lamprey into hatcheries, but um, lamprey don't come right back to their natal stream like salmon do, which is pretty convenient from a hatchery perspective when you can grow them, release them, and they come right back to you. Lamprey are this big mixed popu population. That's also problematic when you think that in the Willamette we have a spring Chinook stock of, uh, 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 a Willamette River spring Chinook stock uh, um, that we can list as endangered or threatened. We can't do that with lamprey because as far as we know right now, it's one big mixed popu population from here all the way across the Pacific Rim. Um, so that's, that's another thing that's problematic for these fish. So lots of effort being put um, on researching. What you saw there was a radio tag being implanted in the lamprey, then being released where uh, researchers are really uh, just starting to learn how they move around in the watershed, and especially big watersheds like the Columbia. So I, I think the last thing I think about is this fish, is it's a neighbor. Um, we've already talked about Willamette is one of the, the Willamette is one of the strongholds for Pacific lamprey in the Columbia Basin. And if you think about it from a watershed perspective, we're connected to people in Washington, people alongside the Clearwater River in Idaho, uh, the Yakima, the John Day. We're part of the Columbia Basin. Um, right now, lamprey are doing best in the Willamette. Part of that is because the main stem Columbia is pretty dammed up and they're having a lot of trouble with it and probably lots of other things. Um, but the Mary's River is, a, uh, is one of their spawning streams, one of the, one of the ones that they're known to use. Um, here we are, we're probably 100 yards from the Willamette River. It, it might be unlikely, but I'd like to think that there's a larval Pacific lamprey you know, somewhere underneath me right here in just an ancestral channel of the Willamette. And that's maybe unlikely, but it's conceivable. That's, um, these fish are all around us in some ways. And if you live near a creek, that, from the smallest little creek to a big river like the Willamette, they're part of, um, they're part of our uh, heritage. And, and uh, again, they're, they're, they're the ones that we might be, um, that, that are the toughest ones to see. And so in, in some ways, I think these are, this is we're gonna really test, this fish tests our ability to take care of rivers, to take care of ecosystems. It needs clean water. It needs clean stream beds. It needs um, a big, continuous, connected river that it can migrate out and, and back. And then it meet, needs a healthy ocean that it can go out and make a living out there. And then it needs sympathy from us. And the, all of those things are extremely hard to get these days for lamprey. Um, that's most of what I wanted to show you. Um, the last little bit, I want to show you another video. Um, you'll recognize um, this person. This is Elmer Crow. Um, who is uh, undeniably the world's ambassador for Pacific lamprey and the biggest diplomat. Uh, Elmer passed away this past year and a lot of the lamprey community is, is still kind of reeling from losing Elmer and losing such a passionate force. And there's Elmer with his grandson releasing lamprey um, into a river in Idaho. And uh, on Saturday the 21st, or I'm sorry, Friday the 21st of February, we're gonna be showing um, a, a film called The Lost Fish is part of the Corvallis Eco Film Festival at the Odd Fellows Hall. And what I'm going to show you now is just a little trailer for that. And that's, uh, that's the last thing I'll say. Thank you, everyone.
Hi, everybody. Uh, it's certainly a, a pleasure to be here uh, with you this evening. Can you hear me okay? Is this working? Good. Uh, it's amazing given the uh, weather outside and so forth. And uh, it's also amazing to be able to chat about Lamprey and watch Jeremy uh, Monroe's uh, films and photography. And I think the message that he portrays is absolutely spectacular. Thank you, Jeremy. So like I said, it's, it's a treat for me to be here. And what I'd like to do is share a bunch of stories with you rather than one big story because very unfortunately we don't have a big story. We just don't know enough about these critters to tell you something from beginning to end and have a very nice take home message. So what I'll tell you is I think sort of the state of the art of what we know and uh, I'll wind up with some conclusions. I don't think it can be said any better than what Elmer Crow said. These are very cool fish, and we certainly like to think that we haven't seen the very last one. But before I forget, I have some specimens from the OSU fish collection that you're welcome to come up. And please don't take them out of the bottle and handle them. But uh, obviously, these are the adults. And there's a juvenile here that lives in the sediment, like Jeremy said. And there's also a smolt. Anybody know what a salmon smolt is? That's the stage of salmon that goes to the ocean. Well, the guys with the eyes, but that are small, are the smolts of lamprey. And we also have, actually, some rubber castings. Actually, these were made by Elmer Crow, uh, the person in Jeremy's video. And uh, there's a little guy, they don't come with a bow, but there's a little guy um, here that you could see as well. But the adult was actually a, a casting made from an adult lamprey. So it's very, very much the way they are. And one of the more interesting things is you'll see a single nostril. And also, this nostril doesn't go through because if you were to latch onto a fish, you couldn't breathe, right? So this nostril is there strictly for smell, not for, uh, for breathing. So you're welcome to come up and uh, take a peek at these guys afterwards. I'm very fortunate to have a ton of people that have educated me about lamprey. This is the gang that's worked with me in the lab. And there's also been many, many other friends and, and colleagues that come from these different agencies and, and uh, organizations and so forth that have sort of allowed our work to, uh, to happen over the last maybe decade or something like that. Interestingly enough, when I first got to Oregon, gosh, I hate to say this, but almost 40 years ago, you go to a fisheries meeting, there would be exactly zero papers on lamprey. Now you go to a meeting, and it's hard not to have whole symposia that would run for days on lamprey. So people have finally recognized how important they are. I'm mainly going to concentrate on this guy, and this is the fish that Jeremy spoke about, the Pacific lamprey. But we really know very little about them, but we also know maybe almost less about some of these other lamprey. There's 39 different species of lamprey in the world. Uh, you know, that contrasts with, like Jeremy said, 20, 30,000 of the fish with jaws, you know, very few of them in the world. Turns out that almost all of them, other than a couple of them, are all in the northern hemisphere. And where do you think most of these species live? but right here in the Pacific Northwest. So we probably have more species of lamprey around here than anywhere else. So I was never really sure, is that because there's more species or we happen to have more taxonomists? So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm going to tell you a little bit about their life history and what we know about the animal's life. But we also, unfortunately, don't know enough to really make good decisions. We know that in general, many species are anadromous, and this goes to the, you know, the, the little quiz before the, before the presentations. Many are parasitic or predaceous. Think about, you know, what's a parasite? How's a predator? How do they differ? You know, that's a very tough thing to define. I'll leave that up to you, but you can, some people call them predators, others call them parasites. But there's also many that are, live in freshwater their whole life. We have some in the internally draining basins in eastern Oregon. Uh, they're non-parasitic. They go through a transformation into an adult form only when they reproduce. They spend their juvenile life, uh, essentially their whole life as a, as a juvenile, never migrate anywhere. They evolved before jaws evolved. That's a long time ago. 300 million, 400 million years ago. Put this in context. This is when the sturgeon evolved about half the uh, time uh, in the past. Here's when dinosaurs come along. And in that same framework, you know, people and salmon evolved at the exact same time. So these are very, very ancient animals. So why in the heck should we care about them? <laughs> you know, it, these things look kind of like space aliens, but they're extremely important. First of all, their biology is amazing. Jeremy alluded to this. You know, they do what salmon do and more. Incredibly amazing fish. 
They're very important for ecosystem management. I mean this in two contexts. They're very important for managing their own ecosystem, and I'll describe that in a second. But they're also really important for us to worry about how to manage our ecosystems by caring for these guys, because they do stuff for the other fishes as well. And then, <coughs> excuse me, also as Jeremy had shown, they're extremely important culturally. Now they did get a bad rap in the Great Lakes. When they built the Welland Canal, lamprey invaded, uh, and they then started to prey upon fishes like lake trout. So there's some controversy about this, but um, it appears that lamprey are sort of the culprit for taking, uh, taking advantage of food that happened to be around, decimating a very popular sport fish, and actually historically a commercial fish. What and there's the Welland Canal. Welland. Welland, connected Lake Erie to Ontario. Welland, Welland Canal. Uh, they probably were in Lake Ontario historically. Uh, but there's literally bazillions of dollars spent nowadays trying to get rid of these guys in the Great Lakes. So we know more about how to get rid of them than we know how to, how to care for them. Um, but they really do have a bad rap and they're, you know, they're very, very positive and important for, for natural ecosystems. One of the things they do is they farm the underground channels. They live in the substrate. When you're walking on a stream, you're walking on sediment, you're probably stepping on lampreys. They are incredibly dense, and I'll show you a, a picture in a second. But basically, they're like the earthworms of the stream bottom. And so they cycle nutrients and so forth, back and forth. And they till the ground and loosen it up, just like earthworms would in your, in your backyard. They're also extremely important as food for other members of the ecosystem. Ducks and mammals and birds. This is a very cool picture taken last year on the LC. This was taken this summer by a colleague of ours, Randy Wildman, here on the Willamette. It's a very foggy day and you can't see it well, but lots of critters eat these animals. But think about this. If you're driving down I-5 and you're hungry for a steak and you know your favorite steakhouse is coming off, so you pull off, Oh my gosh, it's close. What do you do? Well, I, I could settle for a hamburger. So you get in your car, drive down the road a little ways. There's a hamburger stand. My gosh, it's close too. And now you're really hungry. So the next thing you hit's a gas station that has a vending machine and you buy a candy bar. Well, that's sort of what's happening. Because it's very possible that lamprey, first of all, are a much richer diet nutritionally than our other fishes. And as the lamprey decline, what are you going to go to? but you're going to eat what's available, which are things like salmon. So it's highly possible that the lamprey actually buffered our salmon populations from predation by all these critters that, uh, you know, that are hungry and do what hungry animals do. They were also extremely important for Native Americans. They were one of the seven first foods. They were the food of the hunger months. In the months when the salmon weren't there, they basically survived on lamprey. And you've all seen pictures of salmon drying on racks. Well, they also dried lamprey. This is on the Columbia River. And they had you know, special names for them. That they did call them eels, like Jeremy said. They're still a popular food. There's relatively few of them taken in the Willamette Mouth that are still consumed by the local tribes. This is up in Alaska, lamprey harvest. You know, it's happening today. But it was also European food. You know, my ancestor ate these guys. You, many of your guys' ancestors ate these guys. This is from a medieval cookbook on how to catch and prepare lamprey. But they were also the food of kings. Those of you that are historian buffs will recognize this as King Henry I. King Henry, actually against his physician's advice, ate so many lamprey, it killed them. And it's not just an ancient royal tradition, but it's a contemporary one. Our present Queen Elizabeth in England's coronation pie was made by the Royal Air Force, and there's the pie, and it was stuffed with, guess what, lamprey. So it's a contemporary royal food. And so it's just not the royals that eat lamprey, but we do as well. You know, here's a current uh, Portuguese diet, lamprey and rice, American uh, Great Lakes region, beer battered lamprey. That's probably my favorite. It's a three-course meal. It's a lamprey, beans, and a good beer. And the reason I show you this picture is to remind me to say that lamprey are an extremely fatty um, food substance. That's probably why predators like them so much. So, and they were the top of the food chain. They ate other fishes. So anything that might be bad that these other fish accumulate can wind up in lamprey. Oops. 
So what happens in fatty animals? They accumulate contaminants. Many contaminants dissolve in the lipid. So if you're eating a salmon that has something stored in it, what's in that salmon is going to wind up in the lipid of whatever ate it. So there can be trophic transfer of contaminants. So one of the things I think we really need to worry about, you know, there's, there's danger warnings about eating too many of the jawed fish as well. These guys are maybe even worse. But this is something we're not looking at at all and I think needs to be taken seriously. And there are also cultural icons in other countries. Here's a country that donated a, a stamp to, to their lamprey. Like was said before in the videos, lamprey were extremely popular historically. This is lamprey going up Willamette Falls at the turn of the last century. You know, there's just a few of them there, right? And even in the mid of the last century, this is a picture taken in 1953 of, uh, of folks harvesting lamprey, and they weren't doing this to eat. Guess what they were doing? Lamprey, when they bore into their prey, secrete an anticoagulant so they don't want this to clot over. They want to just be able to suck body juices. So these people were actually extracting from the buccal glands anticoagulant to use for pharmaceutical purposes. You know, it's pretty cool how, you know, how European man has also derived benefit from these. I should also mention, I don't really have a good picture of this, but lamprey are thought, at least by the Japanese and by the Native Americans, to be aphrodisiacs. And uh, I heard a talk given by a Native American woman who said, when men ate lamprey, you were in trouble at night. <laughs> and uh, the only thing I can say to prove this is true is that one of my former students was Japanese and he ate lamprey and his wife got pregnant, so <laughs> it, there's probably some truth to it. He swears by it anyway. Now, lamprey, you know, it seems like there are a lot around. We don't harvest them like we do salmon. Why in the world should they be declining? Well, historically, we have very little good data on what the populations were. We have some information on what the tribal harvest was at Willamette Falls. And you could see at one point in the 1940s or so, there are about half a million animals harvested. Well, so what started to happen in the 1940s? We started to take wood out of the Willamette. We started to take snags out. Now fisheries management puts wood in. Back then, we took wood out. The other thing that happened is dams went in. If you look at the tributaries to the Willamette, there's a ton of big dams and, and little dams. And then the river channel was simplified. We straightened it out. We took away backwaters. And so this is what it was historically. This is what it is now. It's essentially non-existent, right? But fishery biology didn't know what it was like historically. So right here, about the time I moved to Oregon, everybody said, hey, there's tons of lamprey out there. But you know, this compared to this, I don't think so. So 165 after the fish was first described, they set a quota. And like Jeremy said, they've been petitioned for listing under ESA. It's not just a Willamette thing. Even though the Willamette ramp, uh, lamprey are probably the bastion of what's available still in the Columbia. If you look at the Columbia Dam counts, 1,200 down to nothing. Ice Harbor Dam, you know, starting out at 50,000. And out here, here's the scale above, you know, basically nothing. So status of the Columbia Basin is there have been huge declines everywhere. Willamette Basin has the largest population, but I worry that we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back because of that. You know, the significant tribal harvest in the Columbia still happens here. But it really doesn't mean that the population is sustainable. You know, it's orders of magnitude less than what it was, which makes you wonder how persistent is it really? Not just a Columbia Basin problem. This is Winchester Dam counts. Winchester Dam is on the Umpqua, right on I-5. You can see it when you drive through Roseburg. And you can see the dam counts there. And these are the best counts we have anywhere on the planet for these fish that I know of. It's almost 50,000 animals back in the 60s. And look at it today, in some cases almost no fish. Huge decline on the Umpqua. You know, what's going on there? No big dams, right? And it's happening elsewhere. This is in Japan, the, uh, the Arctic lamprey also disappearing. So it's a worldwide thing. Their life cycle is almost the same as salmon. We know very little about the animals in their native habitat. We know that they basically are in the ocean eat in the ocean and grow large, swim upstream, lay eggs as juveniles and larvae bury in the sediments, smolt, migrate to the ocean, and repeat the process. Exact same life cycle as salmon, right? But there's some very strong differences, and this makes them almost impossible for us to study. First of all, the amicetes live under the sediment. You can't see them. In fact, it's really even hard to get them out without damaging them. 
They're blind. You'll notice in the bottles here, the ones that have no eye. And they also don't have a, um, a sucking type mouth. So when they go through the smultification process and when they go to the ocean, they grow an eye and they also grow a mouth. I'll show you that in a second. And this is what the adult looks like when they come back. So this is what the mouth of a juvenile larval lamprey looks like, mainly built more for sucking, filter feeding maybe. And the smolt size, even though they're in freshwater going out, do latch on to prey, and they can eat from prey on their way out. And then this is what the adult looks like. Jeremy had some beautiful footage of that. But the time frame for when this happens is so different, and again, is why it's so hard to study these guys. That's a coho salmon. Spends about not quite two years in freshwater, spends a few months as a juvenile going out, spends another 18 months as an adult, a couple of weeks as, you know, in reproducing in freshwater, and they come back. So <coughs> roughly three years. Well, this is what the lamprey does. Five years, seven years, sometimes 10 years in the sediment before they make this transition. So when you start a project, you're dealing with a, your own lifetime in terms of trying to understand one cohort moving through time. Also, the length of time it takes them to go through this transformation, instead of maybe a few weeks, we're dealing with many, many months, sometimes 10 months, and perhaps a longer period of time out in the ocean, and clearly a longer time as an adult in freshwater. So very similar life cycle, but totally different chronology of, of what's going on here. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the amicetes. Like I said, they live in fresh water, they live under the sediment, they have a mouth that's built sort of for filter feeding, and we're trying to figure out what the heck are the factors that relate to their distribution. And what is it maybe that's something that we can work on to, to restore? So we can go out there and find fish with electrofishing. Jeremy showed you that, and that was in the last picture. We can go out there and look at habitat and measure different things. And what we've basically found was that off-channel habitat, the kind of habitat that's disappearing, right? People are sort of channelizing rivers, simplifying rivers. This is an index of abundance of the fish. Relatively few in riffles, relatively few in pools, but tons of them in these off-channel habitats. So this is something we could maybe concentrate on if we needed to do something about them. The other thing that's interesting is the importance of sediment. Each one of these lines represents a tributary to the Willamette River, the Mary's River and, and, uh, and so forth is in here. And what you can see is that there's a positive relationship of fish abundance, that's density here, and sediment depth. So the deeper the sediment, and we're talking about very fine sort of material, th the more fish you're gonna have, except in one place, which is the Tualatin River, and the Tualatin's unique for a variety of reasons. Another thing we could concentrate on, if we could create environments that would maintain certain types of sediment, we're gonna create great habitat for, for lamprey. What does this look like? You know, again, it's very difficult to study. You can't just go down there and look at the stuff under the sediment. So if you put lamprey in a, uh, an ant colony or an aquarium or something like that, what you can see are these burrows. This is against the glass of the aquarium. So they go down about 10 centimeters, something like that, very often at this angle. But we don't know much about what they're eating. We don't know much about how they live. Very little known about what they naturally eat. And in fact, if you look inside of salmon carcass in the streams, not ones on the bank, but in the water, sometimes you find these juvenile lamprey in the salmon carcass. So this tells me they're not there sitting filter feeding, and they're not filter feeding an adult salmon. What they're probably doing is actually going in there and grazing. They're probably eating diatoms and bacteria that are in the salmon as the salmon is decomposing. You know, that's our theory. But we have some more evidence that suggests that's true. Nobody knows what these guys maybe do at night. And in the day, you can't see them. You know, you're walking along the stream, you don't see a bunch of lamprey out there. So this is a tank at our fish lab. We have an actually, we have a wonderful fish lab here in Corvallis. Uh, if you play Tristan Tree Golf Course, we're on the back nine, just outside the fence. Uh, but this is a tank that has juvenile lamprey in it. It's filled with sandy loam and wood chips. And there's about a thousand animals living in here. So if you put a camera over it and do time-lapse photography at night, so you just get a flash, this is what you find. These guys come out at night. We didn't know this until now. So they come out at night, and I'm speculating, they crawl around and actually forage and feed on the surface and feed on things like fishes that happen to be laying there. It's, for, it's very cool. Now, they probably also maybe eat the sediment itself. Very clearly, they take in sand. 
If you take an amacete and just combust it and turn it to ash, that's what it looks like. That's basically uh, if you're dealing with an animal that's not been depurated. If you depurate the animal, you can see sand here. So the animal really is ingesting sand. So here we just have the combustion of the animal. It's ash. That's all ash. But there's sediment actually in that animal. So they probably are actually maybe eating the, the soil itself as well. But that creates a problem. Many of our habitats have been contaminated, and there's a big concern for what's going on down in Portland. You probably all know that the Port of Portland's an EPA Superfund site, and they're trying to restore it. So this whole area of the Willamette in Portland, Willamette Falls is up here somewhere. They're trying to figure out what's going on here, and if you dredge, what is it that you're going to bring up and, and liberate into the water column, and what's that mean also to the fishes that live in here? And so, how do you study that with these lamprey? Well. We were able to get sediments from different places. Some of these have PAHs, others have, these are metabolites of DDT, which is still present in the environment. And we could compare animals and sediments from these different places to reference sediment above Willamette Falls that aren't contaminated like the, the lower Willamette. And if you look for a chemical, you can find it. These are different chemicals that were found basically in lamprey and in sediment from that Port of Portland stuff. So they're loaded with bad things. Does it mean anything to the animal? I think yes. In trying to study these, we abandoned the, the ant colony design because you didn't see them well and, and uh, you can't have very many. But the best thing really to study these are beer cups, like the sort of stuff you might find in uh, this establishment. And you can load the beer cups with sediments that come from different places. and if you look at what's going on with the sediment that comes from a reference site that's relatively clean, it's upstream of Willamette Falls. This is a lamprey we're looking straight down on. If you could play that, please, Larry. Just click on it. You put the lamprey in, and you can see them disappearing. OK, so the next one, please. So here we have a higher magnification. This is the animal. This is the head. I want you to pay attention right here. So this guy's just laying there. This is coming from one of the contaminated sites. There you go. You see the cough? It doesn't bury, and he's actually, in a sense, gagging in this sort of sediment. This is what they're living in down around Port of Portland. You know, so I would argue, you know, this stuff does mean something to these, to these animals. Okay, I'm going to make a quick transgression to go down south to show you some other interesting things about the juvenile lamprey. This is the impoundment above Winchester Dam. It's basically a water skiing area for folks in Roseburg. And this is great amacete habitat. You know, sediment behind a dam, really good sandy, loamy sort of stuff for these guys to burrow in. But what happens is they draw that dam down sometime just to clean and fix holes in the dam. And so what they're doing is exposing this habitat. And unfortunately, they do it really fast. They just open the dam, draw it down. And that's what you find. This is the density of lamprey living and all that. So there were literally tens of millions of juvenile lamprey killed by drawing that reservoir down. Uh, you can see how dense they really are in that kind of habitat. It's pretty doggone amazing. OK. We know virtually nothing about the smolt stage. Don't know much about salmon smolt either, to be honest with you. But we know almost you know, nothing about these. We do know that they aren't bad swimmers, and here's when we put a radio tag on the outside of it to see if it could carry a radio tag. You could see it swimming there. The problem is the body cavity is so small that you can't even put a battery, like the smallest hearing aid battery, inside the body cavity, not alone a tag. So you have to put it on the outside, and the lamprey are really adept at getting those tags off. They literally tie themselves in an overhand knot and strip that tag off. It's just absolutely amazing. So let's turn now to the adult. You know, we also don't know much about the adult. Probably more about the adult in freshwater than any other stage. But you know, they're lost in the ocean, so we know nothing about them in the ocean. What are the limiting factors for adults? Well, we really don't even know what its life history is. You know, it's a really cool picture from Jeremy. But we know basically they'll enter freshwater and disperse. Sometime enter in the summer, hang out in the summer and move around. Then we know that they will hold in fresh water basically all winter long. And then they will undergo a second migration. So fish like up here, Corvallis, will enter the Columbia River. We don't know when. 
We know they show up at Willamette Falls in the early summer. They undergo a short migration. Then they'll spend all winter hanging out in an area probably the size of the stage. So one fish will hang out in a small spot, move around a little bit so they're not like hibernating. And then they'll start a second movement, which is this reproductive movement. And this is where they're following pheromones. Like Jeremy had indicated, they move or home, if you will, to the scent of other juvenile lamprey. There is very little genetic structuring that we know of in lamprey. So it's not like salmon where we could tell this population from that population, even in the same river basin. In lamprey, we could tell fish like south of Cape Blanco, north of Cape Blanco. You know, it's that kind of huge divisions. So they're really probably more oriented just to the smell of, hey, this was probably a good spawning stream because there's juveniles up there, therefore I'm going up there, not that this was where I was born. So they don't home in a conventional sense. They, they also time their reproduction to adult pheromones. They talk to each other, not so much with behavior like you see a lot of other fishes do, but they're communicating by smell. So the one sex releases a chemical that tells the other sex, hey honey, I'm ready. Naturally, fish could navigate up these sort of impediments. This is Willamette Falls. This is what it might look like in the summer now, and this is one year. This is actually an extreme example. There's a little more flow over here. But anyway, it's pretty hard for an animal to get up that. But these are other impediments. Low head dams in the Willamette, they make it up here for some reason. And these are fish ladders built for salmon, and you all know from the quiz now, they don't do right angles well, so they don't go up here. Other unnatural barriers, you know, there's biggies on the Columbia River. We also have a ton of these big ones in the Willamette, and look at that for a right angle turn. So what you'll see here is a fish ladder that's been retrofitted with a round lip. So this fish makes it almost all the way around, then he gets washed back. And then he tries it again. And you can see it's been cut off here. And he tries it again. And one more time, and see how round it is? And he makes it through. So they can negotiate these sort of things not by swimming, but by sort of sucking their way around, but they just can't latch on if it's, a, if it's a right angle. So fish ladders need to be retrofitted. Unfortunately, the new ones have uh, beveled edges. But to help lamprey over other obstruct, uh, obstructions, people have built what they call lamprey ramps. Instead of having a ladder, they build a ramp. So these are now being retrofitted on most of the Columbia River dams. There's a couple of them actually at Willamette Falls at Oregon City. And so this helps the lamprey pass up over these. And there's resting pools. and so they can climb up here and then rest and climb up here and rest and so forth to get over these big dams. And these things seem to work okay, but this is a brand new technology that, you know, the consequence of this hasn't been figured out yet, but it, it seems like it's a good fix, though expensive. Another problem with studying these lamprey, even as the adults, is how in the heck do you catch them? You can't angle for them, you can't seine them. And so we try all sorts of traps and uh, they sort of work, but not very well, so you can't get good sample sizes. But you can actually pick them off the rocks. This is part of my gang. And we can do things. We can take their blood. We can measure them. We can weigh them. We can look at their insides. And from that, we can get some idea of reproductive biology by looking at sex hormones and, and that kind of thing. But we can also put radio tags in them at Willamette Falls. So there's actually a fish trap there. The fish go into there. They can be caught. You can put a radio tag into them. These are what these tags look like. There's the incision, you suture them up, the antenna sticks out, and then you can track them around for about a year. And then you can get an airplane and chase them around the Willamette or a boat or whatever. You get gross ideas of movement and behavior. But the best we can do is figure out what the lamprey are doing from here up. We have no idea what they're doing here. We also have no idea what they're like coming in from the ocean. So fortunately for us, the Karuk tribe actually harvests lamprey in the mouth of the Klamath River. So this is the best we can do everywhere else. But we can actually get lamprey right from the surf. They actually get right here in the surf zone. So that's the best lamprey we can get to know what it's like coming back from the ocean. And so what we've basically found is that they migrate early in the summer. They slow during peak temperatures. They select for cold water. And we have some that actually might move in the fall as well. 
and they choose coarse substrate. Now it's amazing, we bring these into our fish lab here in Corvallis and we have one male, these, by the way, these fish are like salmon, they don't eat when they come back from the ocean. This fish lived for three years without eating and then finally perished. That's three years, can you imagine hanging out without eating? Uh, but they need coarse substrate to, to overwinter. That's what the Willamette looks like in the spring, that's the summer, there's actually a dam boards across here, so it's a really strong impediment, and when the water gets low and hot, this is what happens. So three years ago, there was a huge lamprey kill below Willamette Falls because low flows, they couldn't get up the, up the waterfall, and then the water got hot and oxygen got low. Big problem. We can also go out and look for reds. Reds are nests. You saw some beautiful pictures of lamprey moving rocks and that sort of stuff. Really cool biology. And basically late April to May, um, well, late April through June is when these guys spawn. And they dig these reds. Very easy to see. They're kind of like a steelhead red, just smaller. Get to spend your summer doing this. If you work for me, I delete emails all day. And you can go to these different places in the Willamette Basin and look for reds and lamprey and also do habitat sort of stuff. And what we found with the adults, and this is the Royal Wee, basically this is a selection index of habitat. If you're above this line, it means you kind of like the kind of habitat. If you're below the line, it means you tend to not like that kind of habitat. What they really like is fine alluvial sediments uh, and intrusive rocks um, this is for juvenile rearing, basically. So the, the juveniles will select this kind of habitat. Uh, so the underlying geology, fine gravel is great, fine sediments, intrusive rock isn't. But anywhere in the basin where they have access, you will find juvenile lampreys if they can get into the, uh, the nooks and crannies and find sediment. Other things we've learned about their reproductive biology, looking at hormones and things, um, are complemented by looking at the anatomy. These are the two dorsal fins. And you see this gap here? As they mature, because they're staying now in freshwater for almost a year, if you caught the time frame here, that dorsal gap here shrinks, so they start touching. So what's happening is the animal does not have bone, it's cartilage, it's digesting itself away, and it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So you could always tell an animal that's close to spawning because these fins are very near each other. That's what a female looks like. She's only maybe a third the size of what she was when she came back from the ocean. She's very fat because she has eggs, but very, very short and stubby. Dorsal fins touching. They use their lipid reserves, so this is lipid over time. This is gonad stage, immature gonad. Mature gonad, you can see they're digesting away their lipid. So they're basically digesting away their whole body. This is what salmon do too, putting all that energy into gonad formation. Takes them about 11 months to do that. So lipid reserves are high in these fish, much, much higher than in other lampreys. We don't know why. These fish are almost 50% lipid, about 26% in other species. Don't know why. Same in muscle lipids, very, very high in the fish we have, about half as much in other species. They're extremely fecund. That means they've got tons of eggs. This is the ovary of a Pacific lamprey. The ovary looks like regular fish eggs. This is histology of immature going to mature. And typically these fish have, when they come in from the ocean or when they're in the estuary, this is down in the Klamath, almost 300,000 eggs. The extreme being 600,000 eggs in this one fish. When they spawn, there's about 133,000 on the average left. What's happened is they've digested away these excess eggs, but they're still spawning hundreds of thousands of eggs. You know, compare that to a salmonid, a couple thousand. You know, so these fish really have the capacity to breed. They mature very late in life, and what all this means is high fecundity, late maturity, suggests that they have a periodic life history strategy, meaning sort of boomer bust years which really goes along with environments that have large spatial and seasonal variation. It's like compare the weather we have outside right now with what we had last year. Totally different. We have lots of variation. These animals were designed to do well in boomer bust years. They've got tons of eggs. Males are also typical. That's what a normal testes looks like. Immature going through maturity. And the reason I'm showing you that is this slide. We found several animals that were intersex males. This is all sperm here, spermatogonia. And what you can see here are three oocytes, meaning this male also is producing eggs. Why, we don't know. 
it's very likely that this is due to contaminants. Female, hor female um, hormones in these fish you know, cause eggs to be formed. Many, many contaminants, DDTs, um, healthcare products, birth control pills, soap, or all estrogenic maybe could be causing this in these fish. We don't know why, but, but it's out there, unfortunately. We also found that the testes of males atrophy through the season. That means if you find an animal there in, uh, in May, the testes are in good shape. Later in the year, the testes are uh, basically uh, atrophying, meaning that, that the sperm are being reabsorbed. Um, what that means, we don't know. It's possible that it's different animals moving in, so the sample is changing. It's possible that the same fish are hanging out and, and their, their gonads are changing. The idea is that they can no longer have viable testes later on. The other thing that's interesting is that females disappear from the population at Willamette Falls. So again, when you're sampling these animals and you go out to get a sample of something, you never know the nature of what you're going to get. It makes it really hard to study. We don't know why this is happening either. These fish are not eating. And their gut is shrinking because of that. They're using up all their energy. This is what the normal gut of a lamprey looks like. Make a cross section, you see how which surface area there is for absorption. That's a fish that's hung out for a while when it falls. Gut is very small and has no surface area. So they're digesting their body away over a year before they reproduce. Like I said, lipids go down. <laughs> and the other thing that's interesting is that you can't go to a stream and take a sample and then age these fish. There's no way to age a lamprey yet. Not like a salmon where you can count rings on scales or odalis or something like that. And you would say, maybe we could do something about size of these fish. Well, it turns out that the, the biggest guy and the little guy were both immature males. So just having a sample doesn't tell us really very much about you know, how long they've been, they've been hanging out. And we did have one male, like I said, that hung out for three years. What kind of habitat do they select? If you look in the Willamette for the sorts of places where you find lamprey just holding uh, this is for about six months of the year in the winter spring, associated with wood, with riffly areas, with rocks, revetments, other wood. And there's actually, a, I'm too close to actually see it, but there's a log in here somewhere if you can see it. A single log can have a lamprey on it. They use vegetation as well. The point is they use all these different habitat elements in the Willamette to hold, and they use them in roughly the same proportion of what they're there. So it's kind of like if there's habitat they can get to, they will use it. So access is probably the key to helping these animals disperse. So just to, to wrap this up, I think we really need to understand sort of all levels of biological organization uh, to save these fish. We need to understand sort of from the small, you know, the, the molecular genetics, trying to figure out really who's related to, to whom, who can breed with whom and why and so forth, to sort of the larger scale, you know, the riverscape sort of, sort of approach to things, so that we can look at the landscape and say, okay, this landscape has this kind of nature, it produces this kind of crop, we've done this to the surface of the land to see how it's gonna affect the lamprey. So these species are very adaptable. If they can get there, they'll probably use the habitat. And so what would I recommend as a fix? We have to increase connectivity. We have to allow lamprey to pass dams that are now barrier dams. You know, most of the dams, when you drive up I-20 or Highway uh, 58 going to Eastern Oregon, fish cannot get up over those dams. We have to increase connectivity. And that includes the small areas. And it also includes the off-channel sort of habitats that are so important. And so ultimately, what we need to do is to ensure genetic diversity by allowing for life history diversity to persist. So we can maintain the genetic diversity these fish have, then they can express the life history traits they need to do to survive in a, you know, in a variable environment that we have, particularly in the face of climate change. So why should we care? I'll leave you with this quote by Aldo Leopold. The last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good whether we understood it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but don't understand, then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog of the wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And so I would argue that up until maybe the last dozen years or so, we've really let these important cogs of the wheel uh, experience some, some, uh, some problems and hopefully we can be smart enough now to do something about it. So with that, I'll close, and I know that Jeremy would be pleased to 
to take questions as well. Thank you all.